you who have joined us from around the globe, even with the time difference, to participate in this unique and new event. You are all most welcome. And to you who have responded to the joint invitation of the organizations, their contacts will appear on the chat at one point or another. You are here with a liqa, Christ at the checkpoint, Kairos Palestine, Sabil, and the YWCA, YMCA, because some of you are connected and support one or more of the various groups engaged in theology and human rights, community building, and advocacy work. Many of you have personally met Patriarch Sabah and share his concern and love for human beings, for the meek who will inherit the, world, the earth. It is these principles that bring us together. We are grateful to Omar, Harami, and Sabir for facilitating the logistics of this meeting, for keeping track of the hundreds of participants tonight, and more important, for sound advice during the production of the film. Thank you for being here during these chaotic times when the pandemic and political unrest threaten human lives everywhere. But as the patriarch says, these difficult times will also pass. It is now time to settle down, to watch and listen carefully to the 27 minutes reflection with patriarch Michel Sabah. Let us give thanks first to Dr. Lili Habash, Hilal, and Mohammed Al Attar, the producer and the director of the documentary. Lily, who joins us from Cyprus, is not a producer by profession. Google describes Lily in details in her involvement and achievement as a UN envoy to various states, among them Libya and Niger. Lily's Doctor of Philosophy in Politics thesis at Exeter University is entitled The Paradox of State Building as a Path to Statehood Under Occupation, the Relevance of the Palestinian Case. It is an honest and deep analysis of efforts and mistakes. Lily's open-mindedness and qualities that would predict her future were already apparent when we worked as colleagues at the YWCA and later at Sabil. She can tell you more about how and why she produced the documentary after we watch it. The director, Mohammed Al Attar, Mohammed, where are you? Is a filmmaker and a human rights activist. He was nominated for the Martin Luther King Humanity Award. Among the films he has made are The Iron Wall, which Jimmy Carter said was the best description of the barrier, its routing and impact. I was lucky to meet Mohammed when I was still with Sabil, and he was working on a film about Christians in the Holy Land. I will not say anything about Michel Sabah, because at the end of the documentary, there is detailed information about Patriarch Michel Sabah. If you have any questions to Lily or Mohammed, please write them down on the chat before they speak after the film. So please enjoy watching a different documentary. We are ready. Thank you. Thank you, Patrick Sabah. 
for your messages. Thank you, Lily and Muhammad Al Attar. We have all watched the people's patriarch. Yeah. And I think we now understand why we call him the people's patriarch. His main concern are the human beings and the way they can live together in dignity. I have to see if there are any questions to uh, No, the, or those are all messages. Uh, Omar, can you check if there are any questions to Muhammad and Lily? Because now it is their turn. But before they answer, I have a few questions that you can start thinking about, all of you. Do we see any hopeful efforts in bringing about change for a better world? the way the patriarch wants? Are the documents that we see around us today, the interfaith human brotherhood for a universal world, Pope Francis's Fratelli Tutti, are those conductive to progress? What about the political decision of the International High Court yesterday mm -hmm. to investigate in the whole area of the West Bank, Gaza, and occupied Jerusalem about Israeli war crimes. Is there hope in the new leadership in the USA? What about elections? I will stop here and ask Dr. Lily first for her comments about the film, about the future, and hear also from Muhammad before we go on. Uh, Omar and Mark, I don't see the questions here. I just see people's comments. So if there are any questions, please send them to me or just put them out. Thank you. Inshallah. Thank you. Nora, I think you have to unmute yourself. I'm unmuted. Yeah, mute yourself. I think it's better. Uh, okay. Uh, good evening, everybody. Thank you very much, Nora, for this amazing introduction. And uh, thank you, everybody, for um, being part of this um, event. I Actually, I have to tell you, I feel very emotional. Uh, every time I'm watching the film with everybody, I feel out of speech and very emotional because thank you, thank you. A, a big thank you for your beatitude, Patriarch Michel Sabah. Uh, I do not want, me, my husband has told me now, don't repeat what you have been saying to everybody. So I'm going to tell you why I did the film. I did it because uh, the Patriarch has taught me as a person how to be a, a good human. Uh, the moment I was aware of his uh, significance when he became the first Palestinian patriarch, his universal message was very transforming to me. But it's not only that, it's also following up his path and uh, the effort that he has put in reaching out uh, to, to the world and tell them about the just cause of the Palestinians. Uh, again, I think that um, um, in, in the film, th there's a lot of messages. Each single message can take a book or more than a book to try and decipher and try to build upon. And I, I just want to, to say something about uh, the significance of the messages and definitely, definitely the concern of the messenger, his beatitude. The, his main concern is how to turn ideas and, uh, and thoughtfulness and concern into action. What are the next steps? Again, as uh, um, Nora said. And I have been trying to, I mean, I'm a secular person, but I'm also a Christian and a very fervent Catholic. But I just wanted to say that I've been following the work of all uh, the amazing uh, organizations, the Palestinians and their outreach to all the international solidarity movement, whether it is Christian or Muslim or secular or what have you. And I think that this has been an amazing work. 
for for one main thing, it's because they make the Palestinians feel that they are not alone in their struggle. But, but and but. I mean, what is the biggest challenge to transform advocacy into real policies? I know that there are many who are happy to see Trump gone, but I think that the work starts now. I know also with my modest knowledge about churches, especially in the US that influence politics, many of them are thrilled and happy for Trump's recognition of Jerusalem as the eternal capital uh, of Israel which is something that is very unfair, not from a political point of view, but from a human point of view. And I know that we have our different explanations of the Bible, but I know also that God created us all in his image. So we are all the same people. So going back again to what comes next, I think that there's a, a significant moment trying to benefit from his Beatitudes message is to evaluate the significance and impact that all the solidarity movements have been doing so far. It is good uh, to feel compassion. It is good to continue working. It is good to meet all and feel that we are all one. But then our test is what to do with the next US administration, what to do with the international law, and what to do to transform the reality on the ground. The reality on the ground for the Palestinians, I mean, seems irreversible. This is a big challenge. It's not, it's not a joke. It is something that is deep and the occupation is deepening and the injustice is deepening. And it seems in so many ways that there's no horizon. But as I have been saying in the beginning, even when we reach the bottom, we have to rise up again and start moving again. This is my message to you. Thank you from the bottom of my heart, your beatitude for being there, for having been our, our guiding star. And we also hope that you will continue to be all the time, especially for the young generations in Palestine and the world. Thank you, Omar, and all the uh, organizing institutions again to make this happen. I think that the success of the event today is an exact example of the meaning of unity and unity of work and unity of purpose. I think we can learn not a lot. Thank you very much and have a pleasant evening all. Thank you, Nora. Thank you very much, Lily. Is Mohammed Al Attar around and does he want to say a few words before we move on? Uh, thank you, Nora. Mm. Uh, and good evening to everybody. Um, about 20 years ago, I used to live in San Antonio, Texas, uh, raising my two boys there. The youngest one, Omar, came home one time and he said, I need your help in my homework. I said, okay, what kind of, what kind of a homework? He said, well, I have to do an interview with you. I said, go ahead. So he got his recorder and started, and, and he said, who is your hero? I said, I don't know. No one ever asked me that question. He said, oh, come on, just say anybody, Michael Jordan, anybody. Just, I need to finish my homework. I said, no, no one ever asked me that question. So I need to think about it and answer it right. So the next day, I really thought about it. The next day he came in and opened his recorder and he said, okay, so who is your hero? I said, Jesus. And you should see his face. And he looked at me and he said, but we Muslim. I said, yeah, I know we Muslim, but Jesus is my hero, what's the problem? So his next question was, why is Jesus your hero? Jesus is my hero then and still. Because in my opinion, he is the first human rights activist ever existed. I believe his Sermon and the Mount is the best doc document ever existed regarding a human right. I'm someone who have obsession with the human rights. <clears throat> the great Mahatma Gandhi used to say, if I ever met someone who act like Jesus, 
I will, I will become a Christian. Too bad for Mahatma Gandhi. He didn't get the chance to meet Michel Sabah. Michel Sabah is no Jesus, but he is definitely what I call the people of the way, the people who follow the way of Jesus, of justice and peace and humanity for all, for everybody. When I start working on this film, and you know, when I went to meet uh, Michel Sabah, I had a lot of personal stuff going on in my life, and I was really almost depressed. Thank to him, he gave me hope, he gave me clarity, and I am um, grateful to Dr. Havash for giving me the chance to get to close to him and to get to know this great man. I hope, um, I know he's a very modest person, he probably will not say much about himself, but if you don't know him, get to know him. He is definitely a special character, a special Christian man. And right now, as you all know, I think if you were ask me what is the biggest shortage for the Palestinian, it would be hope. We just don't have hope. We've been in this dark hole for so long and it's difficult to see hope within these circumstances. But his word, is always give me a hope. I never made a film and went back and watched it many times. But I probably watched it over 20 times by myself because I want him to impact me before he impact anyone else. Thank you very much. Thank you, Patriarch. May God bless you and may God give you another 100 years. We need you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Muhammad. Okay. I know there are lots of questions, but I don't see them. So I don't know if Mark and uh, uh, Omar have them. But before we do that, okay, there are people around the world who have a say of three minutes each coming from different parts of the world. Is Reverend Frank Chicani with us? Mark, is he with us? Yes, okay. I am here. You are here. So we will start with you. And the way I'm going to introduce all those wonderful people is in one sentence, because you can Google them and find pages of everything they have done for human rights, for justice, and the dignity of all people all around the world, including Palestine, Israel. So Reverend Frank Chicani is today the moderator of the Church's Commission on International Affairs of the WCC. He's member of the All African Conference of Churches, and he was the General Secretary of the South African Council of Churches. So, I will ask him to say what he thinks of the film, where he sees the message of Patriarch Sabah applicable today and what we can do. From his experience as a mediator, as a theologian, as a pastor, as a teacher. So we are with you, Reverend Frank Chicani. Uh, Thank you very much, um, Program Director Nora. Um, I would like to thank the Lord for the pat Patriarch Michel Sabah and the director and producer of this film. Let me just say in the short space of time I have that all the time I listen to the story of Palestine, I'm convinced and I'm going to use a hard language. I'm convinced that they are dealing with the same demons we dealt with in South Africa. That's true. Except that, except that in their case, the demons have invited many other demons to make their struggle much more difficult. 
and mm. and and in that situation, I agree with the patriarch that the way things are, I mean, it's almost like the whole world is against the Palestinians. Nobody cares. Every day people get killed. As a moderator of the Church's Commission on International Affairs, I get reports on a daily basis about what's happening in Palestine. And I've said in my mind, that's why I would never want to be God, because God sees this thing every day, every minute, every hour. And the question is, how can the world watch this and do nothing? That is why the patriarch says the whole world seems to be conspiring against them. So I just want to say a few words about what we should do, because this is critical. I plan to visit um, Israel, Palestine last June, but the pandemic stopped us. And Trump's administration came with what they call the deal of the century, which was really an entrenchment of the oppression and brutalization of the people of Palestine and permanently robbing them of their rights. What I think we need to do is to defeat this seemingly invincible force or forces which must, which must together produce our deal of the century. It means we must produce our deal of the century, which is based on just, just peace for both Palestinians and Israelis, everybody can have peace there, which is just. We must mobilize, and this is what we learned from South Africa, the global community in the way the anti-apartheid movement was mobilized. They mobilized citizens of each country to take on their own countries. They mobilized civil society and, and entities within societies to say that this evil cannot be allowed. And the UN, as you know, declared apartheid a crime against humanity. My experience and knowledge now about Israel and the experience of the Palestinians is that we're experiencing the worst form of apartheid. They have now gone through the laws, the structures, the way they differentiate even between Palestinians themselves. And that we should get the UN declare uh, Israel's policies a crime against humanity. We must get to Europe, especially to our Christian brothers and sisters, to say to them, you know, the the sins of the past which were committed against the Jews must not be used as a way and reason to allow more sins to be committed and committed against the Palestinians. We need to begin to make sure, and this is how we won the struggle in South Africa, to delegitimize the system and delegitimize the basis on which those who support those, that system support it. We need to begin to say to those who support Israel to brutalize Palestinians, that the blood of the people of Palestine will be sought from them because they collaborate by allowing this system to continue. And I believe that no force no nuclear weapons, no sophisticated weaponry could stop us from winning our struggle just by the people resisting the system and getting the international community to support us. This is what I would like to ask that I saw lots of international people here. We need to take, it's our responsibility, not just of Palestinians, to make sure that the world understand the brutality of what's happening in Palestine and stop it. And this is where I rest my case. Thank you so much, 
Reverend Chikani, your experience in so many countries, and especially in yours, gives us hope that what you have achieved, we can also together universally see a better day for the Palestinians and the Israelis if justice is done. And this we can only do with the help of the Creator, with the help of God, working together across religions, across colors, and by sticking to principles of really humanity together. Thank you so much. Next, we go to we go to Reverend Chris Ferguson. Reverend Chris is a Canadian that many of you know in the Church of the United Church of Canada, but today he is here as the General Secretary of the World Commission of the Reformed Churches. He has lived in Jerusalem and witnesses from his experience. We don't want to hear about your organizations. We want to hear your personal thoughts about what can be done or what do you think of the film and so on. I already saw a few questions about what are we going to do with the film? And I cannot answer that. It is the producer and the director who can do that later. Please, Reverend Chris, let us hear you. Thank you very much and uh, begin by giving uh, great thanks to the God of life for the life and ministry and prophetic voice of uh, Michel Sabah and to the uh, producer and the director for uh, really being the uh, loudspeaker that transmits that voice. Mm -hmm. Right now, uh, in, in the vision that we have and that I have, uh, we uh, are living uh, in the time of global empire in a world mm -hmm. fallen among thieves. And that mm -hmm. uh, in this scandalous situation, which my religious community has spoken about, there is a great uprising going on against what we could see in the reading of the signs of the times as a situation of systemic and structural global apartheid, the ravages of empire that mm. defends and protects an unjust economic system that leads to ecological destruction. Through Patriarch Sabah's being lifted up as part of this uprising against this, points us fundamentally the particularities of the struggle of the Palestinian people and the refusal of the world community to address the roots of their suffering is a clue to the mobilization that we must have to overcome global apartheid and the ravages of empire. I joined, of course, with Frank Shikani to say we need now, and this is the strong voice, is our hope, the hope in the living God that is lifted up so much by Michel Savard that the film uh, exercises so well, is that at the one time, this is a global struggle that we for all of us, and it must be reunited with the other struggles around the world. The connection here though, is unless all of us in our particularity lift up and defend the Palestinian cause, we will have no other access to overcoming the apartheid. What we have here is a situation of a world order that does conspire with through our Christian theology, uh, through our, our interfaith relationships to show that as the Palestinian struggle in all its justice can be relativized and set aside, then all struggles can be set aside. And so that we can look at various fronts of action, whether in Washington, various other kind of models of decolonization and so on. But what we have all failed to do is to realize that the clue for us in our rising up, whether it is the Black Lives Movement, whether it's the farmers in India, whether all these movements are giving us a clue with voices like the voice of Michel Sabah and the Palestinian people whose suffering is a gift to the world 
a terrible gift for us to mobilize and understand that we must concentrate our efforts on these specific local struggles in order to overcome the global uh, ravages of this, uh, th this, this empire. So this requires of us a refusing on all towns, a no, a refusing to accept uh, the uh, normalization of Palestinian suffering and to put it at the forefront of when we're discussing the realities of economic injustice, when we're discussing the realities of gender injustice, when we're discussing the realities of racial injustice, anywhere in the world, what we must do in all our places and spaces is foreground the Palestinian suffering and the, the vision for liberation. That is a hope that we have been given. The film lifts this up through the humble and clear voice of a voice that has been lifted up for us. And we give thanks uh, for that voice, uh, Nora. Uh, when you said that the suffering of the Palestinians is a gift to the world, I was afraid you wanted to continue the suffering so that it would remain a gift to the world. But you really, you really uh, clarified how important it is that we link our own suffering with everything that is happening around the world. Thank you so much. Now we turn to Father Paul Nansou from Pax Christi of Flanders. And if, as you remember, the Patriarch was for a certain time the president of Pax Christi International. Father Paul, who has been in our country so many times, what can you say, what can you tell us in addition to the wonderful messages of Reverend Frank Chicani and Chris Ferguson? Uh, thank you, Nora, and um, nice to meet you. Uh, nice to meet you all, and especially Patriarch Michel Savach. It's uh, some time ago that we met. I do like the uh, the title of the documentary, People's Patriarch. Uh, the documentary is a strong confrontation of the reality of structural violence and the violence going daily. However, the film also gives a strong witness of faith and hope given by Patriarch Sabah. His voice expressing, is expressing a voice of the voiceless, a pastor who lives with the people. Now, each time I'm listening to, I listen to Friends of Palestine, I hear their stories, I feel the pain in myself. Indeed, as Nora said, Michel Sabah has been elected president of Paxist International in, in 1999, and he became the first president outside of Europe, but in the midst, the president living amid a conflict. And that was a big challenge for our movement. And as a major result of the fact that we had a new president in, uh, in uh, Michel Savard, we had an increase of, and deepening of the meaning of, um, of reconciliation, which is the basic concept of our movement, reconciliation. And we, uh, we learned more and more and deeper that reconciliation should be based on justice. And in addition of that, we had a lot of um, um, reset of initiatives uh, towards the Holy Land together with the other, um, other sections and with the World Council of Churches as well. End of September 2000, and I don't know if the, if the Patriarch is still remembering that, but I was with uh, Michel Sabah in a flight to Copenhagen for the, um, the uh, annual Peace Award Ceremony of, um, of Jub for Jubilee 2000. And this was the time of uh, Ariel Sharon and uh, the provocation at uh, Al-Aqsa. And this became the start of the, uh, the Second Intifada. And very spontaneously, the Patriarch uh, told me, oh, Father Paul, the peace, the peace is lost for another generation. The peace is lost for another generation. Today, we are more than 20 years later. I believe that there is an urgent need and that in, um, in follow-up of uh, the two former speakers, there's an urgent need 
for a new and courageous political leadership on all sides and from all sides with a vision, but also with authority to restart or to start a political process. It is important in that, that type of political process that, that there is a role, a serious role for the civil societies on both sides. Because I, I, I do remember you the, the principle which was used during the South African um, um, apartheid uh, period. The South African slogan was, nothing about us without us. I think the Palestinian people should make use of that principle as well. Nothing about us, but without us. So that means that, uh, that the civil society should be included in a, in, a, in, a, in a possible process coming to a solution. But important as well is what is, always, what is also said by the other speakers is that, um, that the, uh, the, the policy of tolerance towards Israel should be stopped. This policy of tolerance of the last 70 years or more that did not work. Israel has the power position. And Israel wants always more and more. More is never enough for the Israeli governments. And I think the international communities should stop, Western countries especially, should stop that policy of tolerance because it will not end. I believe that the Palestinians and the Palestinian communities have the right to have rights. They have the right to have rights. Human rights require that people be respected and afforded recognition. And they demand that all people have access to the necessities of life and have the freedom to express themselves, to work, to build and create it as they wish, to join with others as they desire and to be free of the scourge of violence. And also, and that in the context and in the spirit of Fratelli Tutti or Tutti Fratelli, uh, I think, a stronger collaboration is needed among the three monotheistic religions, the patriarch reminded us in the documentary, but also um, working together, not only with all the different religions, but also working together with all people of goodwill in creating a culture of togetherness, a, a culture of, of togetherness instead of separation and division. But I believe that the major challenge for all of us is that keeping this conflict, this, uh, this uh, decades conflict, keep it on the agenda, keep it on the political agenda, keep it on the agenda of the churches, and especially also keep it on the agenda of the civil societies, because sometimes this conflict has disappeared from our, from our perspectives. We need to keep it in our perspective. And I believe that the witness and the call of um, his beatitude, Michel Sabah, should be spread worldwide. That means that I hope that technically and, um, and, and it is possible that this documentary, The People's Patriarch, could be used, could be used in the context of, uh, for instance, retreats or used in the context of peace education, seminars, etc. For us, Michel Sabah remains a reference. Palestinians are crying for justice. Christians cannot ignore that call. So my closing sentence is, please, colleagues, please, Patriarch Michel Sabah, please, good friends from, from Palestine and elsewhere in the Middle East, keep the faith and hope alive. That's the only solution. Thank you. Thank you, Father Paul. We do keep the faith and hope alive. Though we do look around and not, do not see that peace is behind the door but we cannot lose hope. Otherwise, we would not be here all together today. And I say, Palestine is not the problem. Palestine is the key for peace, not only in our region, but also all around the world. We have heard clergymen, and now I turn to Dr. Saliba Sarsar from the University of Monmouth who is a political science professor, but who has worked for years and has got awards for trying to bring about understanding and people living together. 
he, uh, Professor Sarsar, we are so proud you are with us because you are somebody from Jerusalem who was raised in Jerusalem, though you are in the States today. Welcome. Thank you very much, uh, Lily and uh, Nora and Mohammed, uh, for a terrific uh, uh, work. And uh, to his uh, beatitude, I'm so happy to uh, be with you as well. Uh, I have met uh, several of you over the years, and I am so happy to share with you a few remarks about how to move forward in support of human dignity and a just peace for all. I take the lead from his beatitude, who has inspired many of us by his witness and by daring to speak truth to power. I take the lead from his beatitude as he has been a servant leader, consciously choosing to serve, to serve first. I take the lead from his beatitude's vision anchored in the four pillars of peace as found in the encyclical Parsimentaris, truth, justice, love, and freedom. These virtues lead to four critical conditions, which are first, to acknowledge rights and duties. Second, to respect the rights of others and to take a, responsibility, a responsible place in the world. Third, to feel a solidarity toward the needs of others. And finally, to make decisions and choices according to natural reasons. As his beatitude has argued, God created us for peace and justice in order to have the fullness of freedom. Peace and justice are two sides of the same coin. There is no peace without justice and there is no justice without peace. Moreover, there is no freedom and no justice when it is on the account of others and on the account of what is just for others. Along with his beatitude, I call upon all of us to pass from our present state of death unto new life, a life that is rooted in the peace and love of God, and a life that is characterized by mutual trust and respect for one another's dignity, land, and independence. Each of us is endowed with special gifts we bring to the table. We need to use them to educate, to advocate, and to serve, it behooves us to support each other's rights. It behooves us to rise above ideology, politics, and religious affiliation. True peace comes to us when we prepare for it. Our children deserve a better tomorrow than today or yesterday. If peace does not embrace us, who or what will it embrace? If not now, when Palestinians and Israelis are capable of mutual respect and reconciliation. We see this in many groups around the region uh, who have engaged in peace building efforts. Uh, I can name many of them. I have a recent book that talks about peace building in Israel, Palestine. We can name groups like Neve Shalom, we can think of hand in hand. We can think of Givat Chaviva. We can think of many others. So there are civil society organizations that we need to engage and I agree with the, form, with the other speakers about that. It is time for each of us to contribute to the mosaic that is the Holy Land. If we do so with faith, hope and resilience, we will be the better for it. Ultimately, our collective action will imbue the Holy Land and beyond with care and compassion and set the dove of peace free. That is the dream and vision we seek. That is the soul and spirit of the Holy Land. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Professor Sarsar. I agree with most of what you have said. 
but there is a first step before we can go into all these beautiful dialogues and working together. Will the oppressor admit the wrongs that it has done towards the oppressed? When will the world really see that the Palestinians are not victimizing themselves, but truly, truly, we have been robbed, not only of land, of our children, even of our memory. So I hope that we can have some pressure on the oppressor to really admit. And like in South Africa, you had commissions of reconciliation where people admitted their wrongs. Maybe we can also have it here. Thank you so much. Now we have heard everybody, but not the most important person who is the people's patriarch. So I turn towards you, my mentor, my wise guidance to respond to the people with whatever message you want to give us. Patrick Sabah, are you there? I'm here. <clears throat> okay. Well, first of all, I say thank you to all of you for your interest in our existence, in our question of this holy land. Now, the question, as uh, some said, is a global question. It's not only Palestinian people, it's not only Israeli people, it is the world. Mm -hmm. The world is born in Jerusalem. Thank you. <laughs> as long as we have war in Jerusalem, as long as Jerusalem is a place where there is no love, the world as well, there will be no love in the world. So the question is the question of, a, of the international community. Both of us here in Palestine and Israel, we have to be, say Israel has to be saved from itself. And once Israel is saved, we will be all saved. So it is the international community must make a conversion in its vision of its love and support for Israel. Practically, in reality, the international community, the support of the international community of Israel is not the real support. It is a support which leaves Israel going in, a, in the wrong way. So the international community has to do something. Now here in the land, I see that some of you quoted the Wahd salam the Wazis of Peace. The Oasis of Peace, this is a small foundation, which is the symbol of what must be all this holy land. Israeli, Jews, Christians, Palestinians, Muslims, all alike. But this, uh, this, me this meeting, gathering in one, should be first in the hearts. So I think the Israeli need a new education. Palestinians, we need a new education in order to see the human being in the other and the equality in human rights in the other. Now, what can we do? Palestinians, we have to keep hoping. We are right, we are in our home. We are not wrong in being our home. So we keep hoping and keep making ourselves better and better dealing with all our problems. 
Israel must as well make an effort to see its own human dignity and the, the human dignity of the Palestinian. They cannot, Israel cannot have peace as long as Palestinians have no peace. Both of us, we are linked. Either we are in peace or we are in war. Now we are in war. And the choice is the choice of the stronger, Israel. So we say that we have to, to reach a point in which Israel must see the human being in itself, in its people, and, uh, and in the Palestinian people as well. And I say that we have not to lose hope, neither the Palestinians nor the international community. Nothing was done until now. 70 years, nothing was done. Much was said, but we have not to lose hope. Something must be done. The Holy Land must be saved with its two peoples, the Israeli and the Palestinian. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much, Patrick Sabah. We listen, we accept what you say, but we all know that it is not very easy. It is not easy to forget the past or to think about a better world here, okay? As we all know, Jesus cried over Jerusalem and the church where you are praying, the Dominus Flevit is supposed to be the site when he looked over Jerusalem and cried over Jerusalem. He also said, we are all crying even today in our city, but we are also crying with the rest of the world who still does not know the things that make for peace. Now we all have a big responsibility, as you so clearly told us, speakers, people who want to ask questions, and so on. And I'm going to stop speaking and ask Omar and Mark if we can extend our meeting for 10 more minutes for people who want to stay and ask questions. But I will just mention a little girl who on the American inauguration day said, there is light in the world. Are we courageous enough to see that light? And more important, are we courageous enough to be the light? So my message to each one of us is, in the little we can do, let us be the light that will break the darkness of the tunnel. Thank you so much. Now we will open for 10 minutes only because I know there are people who want to ask direct questions. You don't have to go through me. You go through Omar or Mark and let us see. You can, uh, you can ask any question to anybody as long as it is relevant to what we did tonight. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you, um, Nora. Um, we have the questions. Um, I've sent you the questions by email, but it seems there's a problem with your Zoom chat. Um, yeah, unfortunately, yeah. Okay, so, um, I know so there is. So I'll yes. ask the first question, and you can have a look at the rest of the questions. Is the first question is for Dr. Lily? Um, okay. Um, Dr. Lily, um, let what me, let, stands for distribution of the film? Will it be seen by the Pope? 
and major uh, Christian leaders uh, and um, uh, leaders of Christian denominations. Sorry, will it be cleared? You said Omar by the poll. What are the plans for this oh. for the distribution of the film? Will it be seen by the Pope oh, okay. and other major leaders of the Christian denominations? Okay, thank you, Omar, and thank you, Nora, for the amazing uh, job and, of course, your beatitude. But to respond to the question, um, the film is available for everybody to see on YouTube. Uh, and it is not a commercial film. It was done just uh, for the love of his beatitude and for the love of his message. So everybody is free to use the film, show it in your churches, show it in your community uh, centers, and show it in your university. For example, next month we are having a strong debate in the uh, in Michigan uh, State University with academics and uh, on, on the patriarch's message. And I would like to add, I think uh, other people said, like, what next steps? I think that there are two kinds of steps. There are small steps that any one of us can do. And there are big steps that we really need to think uh, hard about. The, the small steps that I see is to use the document and the patriarch's message as a way to uh, disseminate awareness of the Palestinian question, but most importantly, to disseminate awareness and new uh, understanding of the universality of human beings. As everybody has said, it is not only because we are Palestinians or Israelis, we are concerned about the future of humanity. So this can be shown in churches, in schools, and catechism, et cetera. And there can be a lot of debate around it on how to mobilize people for action. The other thing, and this goes back to the uh, idea that I launched when I first spoke, is what to do next in terms of turning solidarity, the, the significance of solidarity movements into political action. I think some of us or some may, may say, okay, what has been done has been done. Now Trump has uh, recognized the capital, uh, Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. So we leave it there and we try to be positive with the Biden uh, administration. I, I think that it is wrong to think about it this way. We have to think hardly how to undo the decision, how to mobilize the US foreign policy to reconsider a lot of things that are now uh, being done as fait accompli. This is the, 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 the heart of the matter. We need to turn advocacy into real action. You elect your uh, responsible people, you pay taxes, you are universal human beings. This is how we do it. If we make a small step and succeed, it will show the world that things can be done. It is true that, the, uh, as, as Reverend uh, Shikan has said, the world was united to dismantle the apartheid system in, in South Africa. But the world is united against Palestine. This is the difference. The world is very hypocrite about a lot of values, universality, human beings. The UN is dysfunctional, especially when it comes to Palestine. The only moment that the US has allowed a decent UN Security Council resolution to go on when Obama's administration abstained from a vote. These things have to be turned around. There has to be a way. And the, the Christians around the world are a big mass of people. And they are also in politics everywhere. This is where we need to, to, to work hard. You know, I, I want to end with a story. Almost 20 years ago, I was invited to go and speak to a women's spiritual conference at the UN. And I saw everybody praying. Like everybody was appealing to God, with all due respect, I'm Christian. But I said, no, this is not enough. This is not enough. We need action. Otherwise, our prayers are useless. You know, this is the message that I want to, uh, to leave with you. I think we need to mobilize immediate action to reverse uh, the decisions, the US decision, especially on Jerusalem. That can be a groundbreaking step that can turn things around. Thank you very much from my, the depth of my heart for your interest, for your time and for your devotion. And I, I wish you all the best, God bless you all. And thanks a million, your beatitude for being who you are. Thank
thank you, thank you, and thank you, Mohammed Lattar, for this great film. Thank you. Thank you, Lily. I think it is time, really, to lift up our arms and to start working. Let us think very carefully what we can do, each one of us in our own small communities and link with the others. There was one question that I saw, and I think the patriarch should answer it. It was about the role of the international community, especially the Christians, especially the Christians. What do you tell the Christians of the international community to really bring about a just peace? Uh, the Christians all over the world, being a part as Christians, they belong to Jerusalem. So wow. what happened? Jerusalem happens to them. So it is uh, the responsibility of the churches, church leaders, to give conscience to the faithful that they have a duty towards Jerusalem because it belongs to them. The roots of all Christians are here. So what they can do, as you have said, they have they, they have their political rights in their own countries. So they must only defend human rights. It is a question, it is a political question here. It is a question of human rights. It is the human being, Palestinian human being in question, and the Israeli human being. So everyone especially the Christians being rooted in Jerusalem, they should take this very seriously in their political uh, choices. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Patriarch. Don't you think also that it is a theological question? Don't you think that the churches have really to look at how they understand a just theology and what God wanted for the world. Because if we are taking sides and saying that this is what God wants us to do, then we definitely are going against the will of God. And I think we all want to do the will of God, starting from Jerusalem. Do we have any more questions? It is a, a theological question, of course, mm -hmm. and it must be cleared by the churches, Catholics, and Protestants, and all the churches. But to, to have clearer ideas on this point, I refer to the, to the books, pub, publications of Pastor Reverend Mundus Haq, Mitri Raheb, Hannah Katanash and all the college Bible. They have published enough about this question. Okay. There are no voice. Yes. Um, I, um, you are, Nura, you are on mute. I'm unmuting it. Okay. Uh, uh, I think we have reached the end of a beautiful evening, which has urged us, filled us with zeal and energy to really live our faith and not proclaim that we are believers in humanity and justice. Thank you all so much. And I know that we will meet again when Lily and uh, Mohammed decide what they want to do with their film. But I would also like to thank all the organizations, starting with Al Liqa, Seville, Kairos Palestine, YMCA, YWCA, and Crest at the Checkpoint. 
because for the many years, these groups are the civil society that has been working in Palestine and Israel. And I wish them all the best and have a good evening for those who are going back to their homes and for those who have different times, be well and have a blessed, blessed Sunday tomorrow. Thank you all. And um, we, we forgot to mention also um, HC, yeah? Holy Land Christian Ecumenical Foundation who were also partnering with us. Okay, I didn't see that, so I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> well, good night, Thank everybody. You. Thank you all. Thank you.